Hello ladies and gents and here we are as I said in our last video our next one would be something pretty special London's only lighthouse and our history is included entirely in the tour for us in this one London's only lighthouse built in 1864 the lighthouse was never used to aid navigation on the Thames but to experiment and develop lighting equipment for Trinity House network of lighthouses lightships and boys. In fact there were two lighthouses here at Trinity Boy Wharf as this early view from the Thames shows above. The original one on the left was built in 1854 and demolished in the 1920s. The surviving lighthouse was built in 1864 to the design by James Douglas and the lantern installed by Campbell Johnstone and Company in 1866 both experimental lighthouses were in constant use to test maritime lighting equipment. The roof space adjoining the present lighthouse housed Michael Faraday's workshop for examining lenses and other apparatus which you'll see in our tour. Throughout the early to mid century the experimental lighthouse was used to train lighthouse keepers. It then reverted to testing lights which as was Faraday's practice a century before were observed from Shooter's Hill across the river. The lighthouse is now home to the Long Player, a unique installation by Gem Finer and Artangle. Long Player is a 1,000 year long musical composition. It began playing at midnight on the 31st of December 1999 and will continue to play without repetition until the last moment of 29.99 at which point it will complete its cycle and begin again. Long player can be heard in the lighthouse at Trinity Boy Wolf and globally online which you will hear when we go inside. 1952, 1920 and 1952. Now pause to read these ones if you wish. I will remain for about 10 seconds on each one but I have taken pictures and I only say that because my eyesight is, is pretty poor so... I have taken pictures as I say which you can uh, have a look at and read at your own leisure or pause this and have a read of each one. Built in 18... I can see this one because it's lower down. <laughs> Built in 1864, Grade 2 listed. The building adjoining the lighthouse is the former Chain and Boy Wolf store, the largest surviving Victorian structure at Trinity Boy Wolf, designed by Sir James Douglas, which is that there. Originally stored, it originally stored mooring chains for boys and lightships, as well as large iron boys. The roof has a specially strengthened floor put in at the request of Michael Faraday to take the weight of his experimental equipment. The building's most prominent feature is an experimental lighthouse tower incorporated into the east wall. Now the Chain and Boy store have been reborn as events venues for weddings, exhibitions, music and theatre performances, conferences, parties and filming and photo shoots. and the history of Trinity Boy Wolf. The corporation of Trinity House was originally a voluntary association of shipmen and mariners and was granted a charter by Henry VIII in 1514 as the Guild of Fraternity of the most glorious, undividable Trinity of St. Clements. It received its coat of arms in 1573 and with the authority to erect and maintain beacons, marks and signs of the sea for the better navigation of the coasts of England. Since then, it has been responsible for the boys, lighthouses and lightships and pioneering the techniques involved. Trinity House had its headquarters in the city designed by James Wyatt in 1798 and established Trinity Boy Wharf as its Thameside workshop in 1803, as where we are now. At first, wooden boys and sea marks were made and stored here 
and a mooring was provided for the Trinity House yacht, which was used to lay the buoys and collect them for maintenance and repair. The river wall along the Lee was rebuilt in brick in 1822, making it the oldest surviving structure on site. Overcrowding soon became a problem. In 1875, works expanded westward into the neighbouring property, previously Green Shipyard. By 1910, Trinity Boy Wharf was a major local employer with some 150 engineers, also platers, riveters, pattern makers, blacksmiths, carpenters, painters, chain testers and labourers working here. The wharf continued through the 20th century to be responsible for supplying and maintaining navigation buoys and lightships between Southwold in Suffolk and Dungeness in Kent. It was modernised and partially rebuilt between 1947 and 1966 and finally closed on the 3rd of December 1988 when it was purchased by the London Docklands Development Corporation. In 1996, Urban Space Management won the competition to recreate Trinity Boy Wolf as a centre for creative industries, bringing vibrant new life to this historic site. Many new buildings were constructed during the Victorian period and a number still survive, of which the earliest is the Electrician's Workshop building, which was built in 1836. It was designed by the then Chief Engineer to Trinity House, James Walker. Originally for oil storage, rebuilt, he rebuilt the remainder of the river wall in 1852 and the first of two lighthouses here in 1854. On his death in 1862, he was succeeded by James Douglas, who designed many of Britain's famous lighthouses. The experimental lighthouse and chain boy store were built by Douglas in 1864. In 1869, Trinity House set up an engineering establishment at Trinity Boy Wolf to repair and test the new iron boys then coming into use. And this is that early electrician's workshop there, which is interesting. Over there is Lightship 95, which you'll see at the end of the video, and SS Robin. But we'll have a wee walk around and give you some views. These blue storage containers and these very colorful storage containers here are where people live. People live in these. So this area really has been well rejuvenated, which is nice to see because otherwise it would have just sat empty. And here is the Chain and Boy store built in 1864. I'll walk you around this way. Fat Boy's Diner, sadly closed. It's very, uh, very interesting all this, it really is. You go inside here, you can hear that um, long player sound recording. Sorry. Yeah, it's very recently that closed down the American diner. After we have our little tour inside the lighthouse in a minute, this is interesting, which you will see. I'm taking you over here just for some views. Where we're going to see some River Thames tugs. The two tugs moored here are part of a small collection of historic craft owned by the Museum of Docklands. Their larger vessel, sorry, the larger vessel is the diesel-powered tug Knocker White and the smaller vessel is a launch tug called Varlet. Sorry about the noise, we are very, very close to the London City Airport. The Knocker White. With her tall funnel and high wheelhouse, the Knocker White is typical of many tugs to be seen on the river in the early 20th century. She was formerly named the Cairn Rock and was built in the Netherlands in 1924 for Harrisons of London's Lighterage Limited. She was designed for general towing work on the river and her funnel could be lowered to enable her to pass under bridges. In the early 1960s she was acquired by the Rotherhide based company W.E. White & Sons Towage Limited and given her present name which was reputedly the nickname 
of one of the White family. Their original steam engines were replaced by Petter's diesel engines. Alternate and alterations were made to both the funnel and wheelhouse. In November 1982, she was sold for scrap and parts and her engines removed. She was acquired by the museum in 1984. The Cairnock photographed at Bugsby Reach in 1950. And this image, the renamed Cairnock White, is seen once again at Bugsby Reach some 10 years later. Then you've got the Varlet. The Varlet, this type of tug, was designed for towing barges or lighters and was a common sight in the docks from the 1930s onwards. The Varlet was built in 1935 by James Pollock and Sons of Faversham in Kent for the London Lighterage Company of Vockins & Co Limited. She worked extensively in the West India Royal Docks until the early 1980s. Restoration work on both vessels has been made possible by the support from the Heritage Lottery Fund and the Vokins tug Varlet photographed in the Surrey commercial dock 1941 oh. and here they are there's so much to uh, see in this little area here's Knocker White Time and Tide Bill, brainchild of sculpture Marcus Verget. This unique three metre high aluminium bronze cast bell is part of the Time and Tide series. Based on a new and highly original design developed by Marcus D. Neil McLachlan, the bell is rung by the river to mark each tide tide. And uniquely from just one strike, the bell sounds different notes one after another to form a rich melody. Oh, that's brilliant. The Trinity Boy Wolf Bell is the third in a planned series of 12 bells at widespread locations throughout the UK. The first bell has been installed at Appledore in North Devon, a place of shipyards and extreme tidal ranges, and the second in a remote and beautiful bay off Great Bernia in the Outer Hebrides, where Vikings once landed. Further bells are already being planned in Wales and Suffolk. Fixed in space, rung by power of nature, yet making ever-changing sounds, the bell symbolises complex relationship between man and his environment. The time and tide creates and celebrates and reinforces connections between our history and our environment. Here at Trinity Boy in Leamouth, it will serve as a powerful reminder of the sea and the level rising every sorry the sea let me start again will serve as a powerful marker of the sea level rise at every heart of our maritime history mark us forget the trinity boy wolf bell was launched at high tide on september the 19th 2010 <coughs> for further information see that link here it is oh, that's very interesting isn't it look So if you're around at high tide, you will hear that. And here is the other tug, which is called... I can't remember. That's not what it's called, I just can't remember its name. <laughs> the Varlet. I've just remembered, and it's not written on there, so... Yes, I did remember it. I'll pause you and see if we can get a better view from the other side. Yes, we can indeed. <clears throat> I've already filmed the interior and it was most interesting. To walk in Michael Faraday's footsteps and to hear the sound recording that will long outlive us all. Wandering the Wilderness, .co.uk, the barrier. There's a lot of art stuff around here, and here, my friends, is where the Lee meets the Thames. Ah, packed with maritime history, this area. And she's called Suncrest now.
most interesting. And SS Robin, you'll hear more about towards the end of the video. And here we are. The long player has been playing for 24 years and 52 days. So, let's go in, shall we? Shall go up, and we shall hear that recording that will play for a thousand years. The SS Robin, that is, under restoration at the moment to make it accessible to the public. I love places like this, it's bloody fascinating. Think of all the history this has seen. And it's brilliant, it's being used today as well. But the young lady apologized to me for the noise below. I said, no, I don't mind about that. It's actually nice to hear a place being used and enjoyed. It's a music studio below where the old boy and chain store was. <laughs> Tibetan singing bowls, they are very, very good for healing and meditation. Any of you feeling a bit down or negative or into your meditation and stuff like that, go on YouTube and type in 
healing Tibetan singing bowl. into the lantern and listening post. Well, isn't this just charming and delightful? <clears throat> Look at those views, eh? I sometimes mention about continuity and liking continuity. Well, this is what we're hearing now, the recording. Well, that's about as continuous as you're going to get. We will all be long dead and even our bones probably won't exist by the time that finishes playing. Just there is where um, dying Uber boats come to be nursed back to health. Well, it's police there, no? One of their search and rescue boats. Hope you'll enjoy that. Join me outside. Well, I hope you all found that very interesting. London's only lighthouse and a recording that will play for many, 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 many years. If there's an end of time before that, until then. And 
where we were in that loft up there is the famous Michael Faraday's workshop. And talking of that man, here we're going to go to something interesting, the Faraday effect. Ladies and gentlemen, come inside and experience the world of the famous scientist Michael Faraday. Step back in time to explore this man's incredible genius and find out why some people thought he was hopping mad. Discover the magic of his inventions and enjoy this fully sensory experience created to celebrate the work he did at Trinity Boy Wolf. Brought to you by Full Fool Creations. Sign writing by Sign Hill at Sign Hill. And this is interesting, this one. They've basically recreated in this here shed Michael Faraday's workshop. Below are some images of how Trinity Boy Wolf would have looked during the 19th century. As you can see from the image on the far right, there used to be two lighthouses here. The rear journal was built in 1854 and demolished in the late 1920s. This was the building used by Michael Faraday in his scientific work at Trinity House. The roof space adjoining the surviving lighthouse, which was built in 1864, housed Faraday's workshop for examining lenses and other apparatus. As I said, where we've just been. And talking of the man himself, if you lift up these, which you are encouraged to do, Faraday is rumoured to have kept frogs in his laboratory at the Royal Institute. Legend has it he was able to make their severed legs move as if alive through his experiments with electricity. This concept of, of bringing corpses to life was the basis of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Oh gosh, how horrid. And we shall lift this one up. Michael Faraday was born in London on the 22nd of September 1791 in Newington Butts, now known as Elephant and Castle. And what I like about the desk is, as well, this top drawer, childhood. You've got miscellaneous and miscellany. It's discovery, discovery one. The lance of electricity, discovery two. Electrogenetic induction, discovery three. Hydroelectricity, discovery four. The relationship between electricity and gravity. And discovery five, atmospheric magnetism. Well, I'm try saying that after 71 little glasses of gin. I can't quite make those out. My eyesight's quite poor. And I've not got my reading glasses on. I have taken pictures of these. Oh, you are very close up to them. I am not. The Faraday Effect, 1845. Faraday carried out an amazing experiment to see how light reacted when passing close to a magnet. He placed a piece of heavy glass on the poles of a powerful electromagnet and found that when he turned the magnet on, the state of polarisation of light had changed. This told Faraday that light was affected by a magnet, by a magnet force. 
the magneto-optical effect, which later became known as the Faraday effect. taken pictures of these as well so you can have a little read through. He did have a cat here as well. It was known that he kept a cat here which kept away the mice. Faraday, I'll pause you and you'll join me just over the top, over the uh, side of this car. Sadly, Fat Boy's American style diner is permanently closed. Alas, how sad. These things that I'm walking by here are on my left. People live in those. They're porter cabins and um, people live in them. But what I want to show you is over here. That's this one, which was, until fairly recently, over at the Royal Victoria Docks. And it is Lightship 95, which is now used as a recording studio, which is interesting. Studio entrance. Yeah, that was over at the docks. Royal Victoria Docks not long ago. Remember I did that. That's actually very Interesting. That's nice, it's been good that it's been used for something, isn't it? It'll feature some pictures at the end of this video of the interior of that. And this one, the SS Robin, an old steamship. And you have these interesting and rusty figurines here. Good heavens! That man with porcupine hair has no clothes on. Oh, shame was laying aside. Show you the interior of it first. It will be open to the public sooner or later because they're working on getting the public entrance way onto the ship safe and sound. This was the other one that was at the docks as well. If you scroll back through my page, I don't know when it was. It was in the winter, I know that much. There's a video, a nighttime explore of getting into the grounds of Spillers, the old flower refinery, and we got around these as well. Not in them, but just, just on them. shows its interior they're restoring it back to how it was or have done so anyway Prince Philip was highly involved with in this one there's information over here I'll show you SS Robin I'll point you at that and I'll read it out like all these things this started a long time ago I was a trustee of the Maritime Museum and a director and was very keen on preserving some historic ships because no one was looking after them. SS Robin is particularly interesting because up until the middle of the 19th century all ships throughout history had always been driven by wind and sail. Then suddenly some idiot came along and put an engine in them, that's so Prince Philip isn't it, saying that ships were designed for sail and then engine and eventually engines only and that transition uh, only and that transition period i think in shipbuilding is particularly interesting the great thing about robin is that she's the first development of new technology she was almost like the first airplane from the wright brothers and was the height of leading technology in every respect at the time all modern ships originated from something like Robin. She represents a very important stage in technological development at maritime technology. This new arrangement here 
the barge is a most satisfactory solution and I hope she'll be a great success. His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh. <clears throat> I'll read you out her details now. Built in 1890, SS Robin and her sister ship Rock were built in Orchard Yard Blackwall in London in 1890. Their triple expansion engines were fitted in Dundee by Gourlay Brothers. Both the hull and engineering were top rated by Lloyds of London. The Robin carried cargo around the UK from 1890 until 1900. Cargoes included barrelled herring, coal, china clay and granite for the Caledonian Canal. The Robin was sold to a Spanish company in 1900. She was renamed Maria. She worked in Spain until 1974, mostly carrying coal along the northwest Atlantic coast. In 1974, the Maritime Trust were looking for ships that were historically important. They bought Maria, sailed her back to the UK and named her Robin again. The Robin was restored between 1974 and 1979 by a doused shipyard in Rochester to how she looked in 1890. That's the pictures that we've just seen. After restoration, she was moved to St Catherine's Dock near the Tower of London. She was part of the National Historic Fleet, here as a visitor attraction. The Robin was moved to West India Quay in 1991. She remained there throughout the 90s by which time she was in need of additional restoration. In 2002, she was bought by David and Nishani Kampfner and put in trust and was opened as a photo gallery from 2004 to 2007. Robin was moved onto a floating pontoon permanently and relocated to the Royal Victoria docks in 2011. In the most recent chapter of her varied history, SS Robin, supported by Urban Space Management and Trinity Boy Wolf, returned within 150 metres of where she was built in 1890 on December the 10th, 2023, so not long ago. Robin was moved to Trinity Boy Wolf here. The ship has joined the rest of the collection of the heritage vessels at Trinity Boy Wolf, which together make up a free-to-enjoy open-air museum that helps to illustrate the maritime history of London's trading river Thames. SS Robin now rides proudly elevated three metres above the River Lee on its purpose-built pontoon, safely protected for a long future. Over the next few months, practical access to the ship will be created so that SS Robin can be toured, enjoyed and the archive material examined by the public. What we're looking at right there, this building here, was built in 1835 or 6 and is actually one of England's earliest purpose built electricians' workshops and still survives today, as we learned at the beginning of the video. Hope you all found this one interesting, ladies and gents. Thank you very much for watching. And of course, ending us off of what we came here for. Hope you all enjoyed, and thanks for watching. And there'll be some historic images now. And of course, what is a lighthouse without seeing it lit up, eh? So, here's one I prepared earlier. This was done in my Samuel Pepys Fest filming. And just there, Lee now, London's only lighthouse.